Gedanken sind frei. My thoughts freely flower. The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. Hello. My name is Hugh Henry, and this is Free Thought Forum. We're here with Nick Lee to talk about election reform. Nick Lee is a retired federal employee with 35 years of service in the area of human resource management. He is currently working for a federal contractor conducting investigations of alleged employment discrimination in the federal workforce. He holds a Master's of Public Administration from Southern California. And I've told Nick we're going to get an argument over proportional representation, so let's get started. Well, before we get to that, as you point out, I have a background in public administration. So I consider myself sort of a policy wonk, and I get interested in all kinds of public policy issues. And most recently, I've become concerned about the uh, election process and the uh, problems that we've had, and especially in the past two elections. We had an election process? <laughs> we. They called it that. They oh, okay. It that. Clearly, uh, we have some, some problems there that are leading to an unrepresentative government. Uh, we have a very low voter turnout, the lowest in any industrialized nation. Uh, the average over the past 50 years has been like 51% of the voting age population has even bothered to turn out to vote, which means that 26% of the population has dictated what the other 70 Four uh, percent will do. Well, now we've fixed that because now with the new voting machines, we don't even need voters. We can just gin up a vote, and, <laughs> and two or three people can make decisions about what the rest of us are going to well, do. Well, and we'll talk about those voting machines later, too. What this has led to uh, is the polarized politics, so that we no longer have any middle ground. We've got my way or, or the highway kind yeah. of, of politics. Uh, we have difficulties, as you point out, with the election machinery, uh, the mechanics, the administration of it. We have problems with the unequal uh, campaign financing, so that incumbents have a tremendous advantage, which means, which leads to the, to the statistic that 98% of incumbents get reelected. Well, also you've got incumbent districting, where the legislators district so that the incumbent gets the best deal because, of course, they're all incumbents and it's all a nice boys club. Yes, yes. And we'll talk about redistricting a bit, too. The question is, as a student of history, you know, you can't understand where you are until you know where you've been. And so you have to go back a bit in history. The foundation for all of this is, is that the United States is a result of tremendous compromises throughout. And the very basic Constitution was a, a compromise at the time in that point in history, you had sovereign states that wanted to retain as much right as they could, and so they wrote into the Constitution very limited powers for the federal government. At the time, that seemed to work out, but with differences, with changes, improvements in communications, transportation, the interrelatedness of all of these states, we've had to amend the Constitution several times because, because the, we were not satisfied with how the states were, were operating it. Well, also, they were not operating in the national interest. Also, not many people realize that the Supreme Court's ability to declare a law unconstitutional is not in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court gave it to itself, mm -hmm. and therefore the Constitution became whatever the Supreme Court said it was. Well, and the interpretation, uh, that was the effect of John Marshall, yeah. uh, which is why He's largely noted as the Supreme Court uh, Justice, the most activist of them. Well, but but we've had you know when we when we set out the rules for elections in the Constitution, it simply says that Congress will set the time and place for a presidential election. All other kinds of details are left to the states. Uh, it all the con basic Constitution also talks about districts and how they shall be. Uh, created. 
Uh, and the and, census. And it is based on the census. There are some parameters about how a district ought to be set up, but they're open to interpretation. And, and depending on which end of the political spectrum you're in, or which end of the power, which end of the, the power spectrum you're in, uh, you either are in favor of that or you're not. So we've, we have some, uh, we've, we've come to the point where we are driving people away from the polls. People are not confident that their vote's going to get counted or counted properly. And we are losing the representative form of government. Nick, I spent a great deal of time in the last election, put in 300 bucks of my own money, and now, for just those reasons, I no longer vote. Well, it, as soon as you give up, the bad guy wins. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> so I'm a perfect example of what you're talking about. And, and most recently, we've been concerned about campaign financing, and since the 2000, or since 1990, or 1995, I guess, we've started a, making passing laws to control campaign financing, and that's a sticky wicket to get in. Oh yeah. One of the uh, initial things to discuss, I guess, is the way that elections are administered. We think of it, the, there are several different scales of elections. The presidential election is the one we think of most. But there are state elections, there are local elections, there are elections for bond issues and so on. The administration of most of that falls not only within the states, but within the counties. But the people who are administering these are politicians who are elected, who are who have an initiative to game the, the system. And therein lies some, uh, some of the problems and some of the reasons that we've had this tremendous amount of uh, success rate on the part of the incumbents. The incumbents are able to, uh, at a 98% rate, uh, get elected. And, and because they've been able to arrange the districts, not only in Texas, but in most other places. It's been most spectacular for Texans in the past couple of elections, but it's true in many other places well, where states have a large, you know, almost an even balance of the two major parties. And, and yet, because of the districting, one party will get all of the congressional delegation. Okay, in Texas, they actually improved things with the uh, Tom DeLay redistricting. And here's why. In order to get the maximum number of Republican districts, those districts had to soak up a bunch of Democrats. So, for example, uh, Lamar Smith now has many more Democrats in his district than he used to have, which may gives some hope of making that a Democratic district, uh, small d. In the, most, the least Democratic districts, what happened was that there were Democrats left over that they couldn't soak up. So they pushed them all together in real tight districts. And now Charlie Gonzalez, if he gets you know, nominated, um, he doesn't even have to run. So Charlie's district is the least small D Democratic district in Texas, oddly enough, because it's the most Democratic. Mm -hmm. um, in California, Schwarzenegger has tried a new initiative coming on his ballot that's going to turn uh, election districting take it out of the legislature and turn it over to the courts. I think that's interesting. There are a couple of, of uh, initiatives like that. Because of this perceived uh, notion of partisan manipulation of the district process, both parties should realize by now that that's subject to swing back and forth with each, each uh, election. Yeah, and now it's my turn. It, and it, <laughs> it has turned out that among the 6,000 state representative campaigns that went on in the last election, 40% of them didn't even have anyone running against them. Yeah, it was bad here in Texas. Because the, they, the, all the competitors knew there was no hope. Well, we're the poor for that, for not having a challenger to, to debate the, uh, the incumbent. Well, it was also bad here in Texas because we had a man running statewide and, and that was uh, David Van Oss. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to go down and vote, uh, and you were a Democrat, in many districts, there was only one Democrat there to bother voting for. So why bother showing up? If there's no opponent, you know, to the person in there, 
except for David. So it made it very hard for David to run for his, his statewide office because we had no Democratic opponents. Mm -hmm. Yes. As I say, there are a couple of other states that have tried this. As you mentioned, California has a proposal for using a panel of retired judges to dictate this every descent, uh, tenth year after the uh, census. Uh, Arizona um, creates a, uh, a commission of, it's a bipartisan commission. Uh, I think Iowa has a nonpartisan commission made up of, of bureaucrats, or as I prefer to call them, technocrats, who at least don't have a vested interest in the outcome of the thing. One of the interesting uh, wrinkles of that is that they are not allowed to know the home address of incumbents, so they can't carve a district around that uh, home address. Nick, do you know how that's worked out in, in the places where these things have been used? It, it hasn't been, hasn't had enough time to really be tested, but they're confident that it's going to result in fairer, more competitive elections. Fairer depends on where you stand. Are but they getting more competitive at least? Are they getting more voters? Uh, I, I don't think that either, uh, yes, they, it was a small increase okay. in Arizona. Okay. Uh, so and I think they've, they've done that only uh, for one, one election, I think, for the 2002 election. And I'm not sure how much of that has, uh, has played out yet. So start. all of this is fairly new, but these are things, this is an area, uh, and many of these other areas we're going to be talking about, you can't wait for the politicians to change it because that's how they got there. So they're not about to change these things. These have to be done by a citizen initiative, by the initiative process. And this is one area that uh, can, is, is ripe for that, to bring an initiative to change the way districting is done within the state, since the state has, uh, within the state legislature, has control of that to bring uh, an initiative forward. Many of these other things uh, uh, can also be done through citizen initiatives. And I guess that's the whole point of getting excited about these things and not giving up, throwing up your hands and saying there's nothing that can be done. The, it is frustrating because the power base uh, is very powerful. The money talks uh, that, that incumbents, for example, raise two to three times as much as their challengers do. And the political action committees give eight times as much of their funding to the incumbents. Well, that's a hard thing to get over. Well, I understand that Tom DeLay himself uh, changed the way uh, companies, large companies, give money. Because before him, they tended to give you know, about the same amount to each party. And DeLay started hammering him. They call him the hammer. Mm -hmm. And said, I see you're giving to the Democrats, and you expect me to pass your legislation. I think you'd better stop. And they did. You have to wonder, with the amount of money being spent on elections, what are these people getting? If, for example, Michael Bloomberg in, in New York running for mayor is spending $46 million of his own money, the, an, the annual salary for the mayor is what, 150000 something like that? Well, the last guy who wasn't a wealthy man to run for president of the United States on a serious ticket was Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so as money finds its way into politics, it raises the specter of this uh, um, behind the scene manipulation. You remember the Thomas, Mast, uh, Thomas Nast cartoons in the early uh, 20th century? Oh yeah, with uh, Tammany Hall, all, all the Tammany the, Tiger. All of the politicians were always very fat in vests, and, and behind them were the puppeteers pulling the strings. Um, yeah, named Stanford and J.P. Morgan yes, and, and yes. Gould. Yeah. So that, that it's not a new problem, but it certainly has reared itself within the past half century or so as being almost an intractable problem. And there have been proposals on both extremes. One extreme is let's knock off all of the contributions, put absolute limits on it, we'll fund it. We'll federal funding. Or federal funding. Public funding. That's right. We'll fund the whole thing and, and give you all the money you need. We'll give you free airtime because the broadcasters are, uh, are
are making their profit based upon something that's been given to them anyway, at least they can owe us some public service time. Well, the big, the, one of the huge lobbies against that is the broadcasters themselves. Of course. Because without this election money, they'd be in the red. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I, you know, I think yeah. they, they earn plenty enough from Philip Morris and from Procter Gamble. The other end of the spectrum, of course, is the libertarian view. Let's take off all limits. Let's, let's let the best man, let's the give it over to the free market. Right, let the market decide. And, and whoever coughs up the most money uh, wins. Well, as we've already found, that leads to these inequalities and almost a lock-in for candidates. You don't have a real competitive system going that way. Something in the center, in the middle, uh, clearly needs to be looked at uh, in terms of certainly uh, uh, free airtime is a would cut down the amount of money being spent, and it's a very logical thing to ask of broadcasters. We gave you a license; you're making big money on the license. Just give us these public service hours around election time, and that's what candidates will use to get their word out. Well, for one thing, we get the best politicians' money can buy. <laughs> but well, for another, uh, we said that at the beginning of the 19th century about corporations. You know, we gave you the charter, you're going to have to do, and look where that's gone. Mm -hmm. I don't think these license. I think these licenses are in the same situation as corporate charters. Corporate charters are never questioned, and licenses are never questioned either anymore. Yeah. But clearly we found with the latest spate of campaign financing laws, we've tried to control and we've tweaked them. We've made them so complex that even somebody like Tom DeLay can trip his toe on them. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and so we introduce more unintended consequences in trying to tweak it and, and control the campaign thing. One, one thought uh, that some observers have uh, suggested we introduce into it is the this, this small element of limiting out-of-district contributions for for House, for, for state representative positions, for example, or for uh, congressional uh, districts. If, if this is a district, if this is an election for the members of that district to elect their representative, why are we funding, why are there funds coming in, millions of dollars, from outside the district? Well, the answer is they're, they're uh, gaming the system on a national scale. As, as the Republicans did in uh, getting... Yeah, you go for somebody who's vulnerable. Yes, that's right. And, and it does have an impact on the national scale, but that changes the whole character of that race. That race is supposed to be about who do I want representing me in my district, not who Bill Gates would like to see elected in my district. And incidentally, I don't know that Gates was a major player in any of these, but... I point to him as someone with deep pockets who, who might have been. Uh, trying to think of the, the, the guy who was the, the investor who was uh, very heavily contributing in uh, conservative and, and religious-based. Well, there's the Coors, there's Hunt, mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, we've had someone on this program that laid out the names. Yeah, yeah. And, and that has to be of concern if we're talking about a, the rule of the people. We the people. It's uh, it's an oligarchy that has been built up uh, from the funding, and uh, most of that is is just in the way the electoral process is run, and we can change that. Well, one of the reasons we got here is we were trying to fix something else, which is usual. We were trying to get rid of all those nasty political machines. So we went from uh, caucuses and uh, state conventions nominating people for office to a situation where we have this primary where everybody can vote. And what that did is that removed the party completely and made it completely a money thing. Whoever gets the most money gets the most airtime. Mm -hmm. And that made uh, politics much more money dependent than it had ever been under the old machines because the old machines had to put somebody up there who would deliver the goods for their constituents or they wouldn't stay in. Mm -hmm. The thing that strikes me about uh, presidential primaries particularly is that this is an internal party process that's going on. For them to elect the, the person 
the, or to nominate the person that they feel is going to uh, win the general election. That's internal to the policy, uh, to the party. Why are we funding that? Why aren't they picking up the funds for that? Well, it's, it, the party isn't any, uh, really involved anymore. The money goes right by the party. The party mm -hmm. hardly gets involved in, in funding things, really. And, and while it's true that the old smoke-filled room uh, way of electing the, or selecting the party nominee, I suspect that those old duffers in their, uh, with puffing on their cigars and drinking their Jack Daniels probably came up with a candidate that was going, he may not have been pretty, he may not have had glamour, but he was the one that they were confident would uh, carry the ticket. Harry Truman is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. He's a machine guy, never would have made it in today's world. No. Not a show horse. Yeah. So the, 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 the primary process disturbs me, number one, because we're doing the work that the internal party politicians ought to be doing, and secondly, that we're funding it, and, and thirdly, because it's so protracted and it, and it involves so much money, and it's front-end loaded. Right away, we've got two of the smallest states in the union are deciding who the candidates are going to be. Once Iowa and, and New Hampshire have spoken, the rest of us sit back and, and, and accept whatever candidates come along. So you get great turnout in Iowa and New Hampshire, and the rest of us don't bother showing up. Yeah. Once again, a very undemocratic process, and, and that ought to be of concern to everyone. Uh, and I'm not sure in the case of those primaries uh, what the answer is to that. Uh, oh, that's, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard. It, in fact, uh, that may be an area where we could uh, work on a, a proportional uh, elections. That is, instead of having the first past the post, let the candidates, let several candidates come forward and, and the party nominee will be the one in, in an immediate runoff kind of situation. But uh, the last area, of course, is the one that most people think of when you talk about election reform. Immediately what pops into people's mind is the Electoral College. And you have promised that you're going to go ballistic. And so we're going to put some <laughs> excitement into this, into this program when I talk about the Electoral College. What is it that you have against one man, one vote? What, don't you trust the bourgeoisie? No, no, no. Let's say this one of these last presidential elections, that's what we did. Okay. Now, how do we work this? One man, one vote. Does a majority win or does a plurality win? What do you want it to be? Because if it's a majority that wins, as soon as you get third and fourth parties in there, you got a problem. If you're going to do it through the Electoral College and split the votes up the way I think they do in, what, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. instead of winner-take-all, now it gets even worse. So now you get a Democrat with some, a Republican with some, um, a Libertarian with some, somebody over on the left with some, and now it's deal time. They'd have to go out and deal for these votes to pick them up so they could win in the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. Or if we follow strictly the law and nobody gets a majority there, then it goes to the House of Representatives. So you're going to want to eliminate the Electoral College and go to direct vote. Second, if you're going to go to direct vote, how's the politician going to behave? Now he goes to certain key states. No more. Now he goes to where the people are and ignores where the people aren't. Alaska, you'll never see a candidate, ever. But we're already experiencing that because of the, because of the, uh, the development of these swing states. All of the campaign, not all, but a great portion of the campaign funding and the campaign appearances are in these, these swing states because they've already done their demographics. They already know where the safe states are, where the states that they can't hope to win are, and those are the ones that they'll go after. But any state can turn into a swing state or vice versa. I mean, they float. Not as long as you have this unrepresentative thing with, with some states' votes count more than others. That the states, that the votes, electoral votes in, in Florida uh, have more clout than six other states 
Well, that's because he could take Texas for granted, mm -hmm. and somebody else could take California for granted, and, and that but not always. And that shouldn't be, because then you and I are being taken for granted. We can't, our vote is being washed out. And, and that's, Well, that's always going to happen. No, I don't think it's always going to happen. If, if you do on a popular vote, you do if you want to go on a, on a majority rather than a plurality, then... You got a runoff? Then let's have an instant runoff. We'll have people select their their top three choices. Oh dear. And I would hope they would have more than two choices. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we can only have two parties. I don't no, know how no. we got to this point. Neither did the founders of the Constitution. They never <laughs> expected parties at all. But you, so you, there are mechanisms for an instant runoff thing that would that would result in a majority election for a candidate. Another thing that winner take all does is this. It means that if you have a cause, you don't go out and start your own party because that won't work. Mm -hmm. You have to fold in to side some other party and you have to compromise. And politics is the art of compromise. Now, if you're an extreme centrist like I am, then what you really like is what California used to do called cross-filing, where you could actually file on both parties and if you won both, then the election was moot. Mm -hmm. And if you won either one, then you were in. Yeah. And that produced the finest crop of Republicrats and Democans we've ever seen. <laughs> That's where Earl Warren came from. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to the end, Nick, so you better get, get there. <laughs> well, we talk about the third parties. There, are, uh, there have been a few third parties in our history, and typically they're an ad hoc party. They come up with a, a very uh, some issue that really resonates. And what happens is that they don't get elected, but one of the major parties then uh, co-ops. Yeah, that that's, be that's because you have this, this winner-take-all and this, yep. this requirement yep. to fold in. So what I would hope is that from this, we can get people energized about getting an active, taking an active part in this. Don't hope to work, for, work through your legislature or your representative, but get out on your own with initiatives. There are many groups, uh, they're available. I mean, they're, they're, you can tap into them, Common Cause, League of Women Voters, nonpartisan groups aren't taking one side or the other. They're interested in improving the process, and you can too. Yeah, League of Women Voters is, is they're saints, man, they're yeah. saints. But whatever you do in election reform, don't look at how it ought to work. And in public administration, you ought to know more than anybody else about ought to works. Mm -hmm. Always look at, okay, how's the politician going to behave? How are the, the, the money people going to behave? How are various other people going to place their bets when, they, when you do this reform? Or you'll wind up like we have now with the primaries bought by money. Yeah. Well, we're getting to the end here. Uh, so thank you very much, Nick. It's been nice having you on the program. Well, thank you for inviting me, Hugh. And I, I hope we can do something like reform. And if you've got an initiative, yeah, I'll come back and start working. But the current election system, as far as I'm concerned, it's a fraud. Thank you very much. This has been Hugh Henry for Free Thought Forum. And come again. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny, dig a dog and sin fry.